All right, welcome all to our Academic Standards and Assessments Committee meeting. It is good to be back with you all again. What I wanna do first is have the uh, State Board of Education members on this committee introduce themselves and then we can get going. And we'll start with you, Estella. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm Estella Lopez, I'm the Vice Chair of the uh, Board. Oh my God, I can't get rid of my hair now. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yes, it's, it's the opposite, the opposite way. Anyway, and I I serve on this committee, and I think this is a very critical committee, and I think next year is going to be even more significant. So I'm delighted that the three of you wanted to participate and 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 bring your expertise to this work. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Estella, Malia. Hi, good afternoon. So Malia Sevi, and I am entering into my fifth year on the board. Thrilled to be on this committee this year um, and uh, actually thrilled to see with the, the agenda items. So looking forward to, to jumping in um, and talking through all this with all of you. Thank you, Awilda. Uh, hi, good afternoon. My name is Awilda Riasco and I'm a newbie and I'm looking forward uh, working with each one of you and supporting the committee as much as I can. Thanks, and Martha. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Martha Crew. I'm also new to the board, having come on this winter. Uh, I come to this board and my, my position in this committee uh, from the manufacturing background, from the business world, to fill a seat. Uh, so I'm here to learn and give my perspective, but also to serve uh, as a connector in whatever ways I can to all the stakeholders, both uh, in, in the business and manufacturing community, because there's a great community in Connecticut and they really want to help. Uh, and so uh, I look forward to any opportunities that we can all work together. Awesome. And again, I'm Eric Clemens, a board member, and I have the honor of chairing this, this committee. Um, what I want to do is now is hand it to Irene uh, Parisi. So Irene, can you take us through the agenda? Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll talk to you about the first item on the agenda. Um, so again, my name is Irene Parisi, the Chief Academic Officer for the State Department of Education. And with me is Dr. Gladys Labas, who will be um, walking us through the PowerPoint presentation. The attached PowerPoint that you've received is, serves as a summary and an update of where we are with this important work on the African-American, Black, and Puerto Rican Latino course of studies, which I think you know a lot about and have been a part of this work with CERC. So what I will do is share my screen with the PowerPoint presentation and Dr. Gladys will, Dr. Gladys Labas will present um, some of the details and update. Um, Thank you, Irene. You are welcome. Ajit, if it's going to take me too long, I think I'm having issues, maybe because I'm not the host, it's not letting me share. Ah, uh, yes. I apologize. Yeah, Ajit, it won't let me share. I apologize. Um, perhaps, okay, there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay, well, thank you so much. It, you know, this is so timely, this topic. Um, and we already know in the research, and, and I'm glad the, uh, the legislators moved on this quickly, because we know by the research that students uh, need to see themselves in the curriculum. And that is one of the issues in terms of closing the, I, 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 call, I, I, I like to call it more the opportunity gap. Uh, in order to address those issues. This is a, a format of addressing many of those issues that we see in schools. So, um, and that's what the research is telling us. So Public Act 19-19 is about African-American, Black and Puerto Rican Latino curriculum that will be implemented. The next. Let me just give you a little bit of a timeline. And of course, I'm the newbie on this, so <laughs> on, uh, on the State Department. And I, I got going on this uh, when this epidemic started. So I have been really uh, catching up with all the aspects uh, of, of the processes that have been taking place. 
So right now on, on 121, the school board of ed to review and approve the course content for rigor alignment and curriculum. That is what we're pushing for for uh, January 2021. Then um, by uh, January 2021, submit descriptions of the course to the State Board of Education and including reports development review of course to the General Assembly because they also wanted to see this. We also met with state representatives uh, to get out some clarification and some directions uh, in regards to these timelines. And also by 721's LEAs may offer the course, may offer the course in grades 9 through 12. This is just high school. However, by 7122, they shall, there's no option, will offer the course in grades 9 through 12. Okay, so the timelines and how we're going to deliver this. Uh, we have an advisory group that has been meeting, and you could see the timelines, uh, the timetable there. Uh, we came up with a draft of course objective, both groups, the uh, uh, Black and African American and the Latino Puerto Rican group came up with a draft course objectives. A draft scoping sequence uh, was uh, developed already June 5th. Uh, we will be completing the course and report by September 30th, and we will present on a meeting on November 20th on what we have developed and uh, submit revisions uh, to the Connecticut State Department of Ed in, by December 18th. And that was the timeline that we had. Um, also, I just want you to know, we just got a clarification for the legislators last week because there was some discussions in the groups and um, both by some, uh, because there are like eight committees working on this, but they just finished their work. So now we're picking up on really developing the curriculum. But there was a, a uh, some groups that were thinking that the course uh, needed to be combined, that both during the two semesters they should be combined, but the state legislators just last week clarified very clearly that, that the course is going to be taught separately. One semester will be for a uh, Black African American and the next semester will be for Latino Puerto Rican history. And it doesn't, and it just, it, and it would depend on which one goes first, depending on the districts. But this is the accomplishments that we have had. We have had focus group to collect data. We have done research. We have had many committee meetings. We have de uh, developed uh, content for the Puerto Rican Latino uh, 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 curriculum. Also for the African American Black uh, uh, curriculum we have had joint meetings the two of us together so we could see where we come together and where we are kind of are separated and also we have talked about uh infrastructure support committee meetings how are we going to support uh districts in 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 this process okay uh the research that we have done in the event evaluation. Uh, there, there were surveys conducted and 350 responded, representing 62% of teachers from a variety of districts in all school sizes. 62% re re responded and uh, the readiness and requested comprehensive curriculum, which was great. Um, we conducted focus group, which were very interesting. Uh, also, 32% of the students responded. Research and re warehouse curriculum for se from several other states. We have researched that also uh, to see what other states are doing. Um, we gather out of uh, many aspects from 17 districts where, that are already teaching some parts or some components of these, of these courses. We wanted to see what they were doing right here in Connecticut. And the course syllabus and content development current is using this information to guide their work. 
uh, sample themes that are uh, from the focus group that came out, uh, and this is directly from the respondents, um, include deeper studies of subject course teach beyond stereotypes, um, include inequities in American society, don't just teach victimization, teach resistance, uh, racism. This yeah. is Estela. I, I don't want to interrupt too much, but instead Please. of resistance, can can you use the word teach solutions or, or teach ways of moving forward rather than resistant? Resistant to me, it's more passive, more um not action oriented. So or it and can be action oriented, but in a in a different way. So thank you. What what was the word you use, Estela? Uh solutions. Or, you know, you can find a synonym for so it's again, it's the idea of this is what has happened. How do we move forward? How do we change it? How do we make it better? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I will bring that up. Uh, they use resistance because through our history, and I could only know my, uh, I only know the Puerto Rican history and um, much better. And and you know that there has been very different aspects in our history that we resisted. Uh, but, many but you resisted to, to take it to the action level. You know, resistance no. for me mm -hmm. is not the final, it's, it's a process thing, so. Resilience, or, okay. or resi resilience, yeah. So I agree okay. with you, you know, this, you know, victimization leads to resistance, but then that leads to, you know, some sort of solution. Yeah, yeah. I'll bring it up, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. We had, we, yeah, we had discussions on that, yeah. Question, okay. All right. Um, we also wanted to make sure we included different Latin American countries. It's not just um, because we, it's uh, much more in depth. It's, uh, uh, we have different Latino cultures in, in Connecticut and throughout the world. We want to include those. Teach the real history from different perspectives. That's what all the the teachers, the students, they were all saying that, not just from one um, perspective. Uh, include the state, how uh, African Americans and Black contribute in Connecticut, how Puerto Ricans, Latinos have contribute to Connecticut. Talk about Connecticut. And emphasize on teaching that the differences are a strength. And I think that's where you were coming, Estela, not weaknesses, right? Yeah, and include popular culture, uh, include literature, music, art, because we we have that. And okay, so the next one, the themes, the big themes that educators, parents, and community, because we kind of put them more together here, is they want to see students uh, identifying. The, race, the racial identity and how it started and where we are now. Positive accomplishments. Multi, and from multiple perspective, how to operationalize the challenges that we're still facing in professional learning. These are the big things that all came. Now, these are the themes from the Puerto Rican content development uh, area. One of them is blood and sangre, focusing on the genocide, injustice, the killing and death of Puerto Ricans and Latinos. And the second is sweat sudol, focuses on the social class and economic structure created to take advantage of Latinos and the wealth of each country. And the third, which is what we're saying is defiance, fight, struggle, lucha, Focusing on the effects based off of the blood and sweat experienced by people in countries to fight for a better condition. So those are the things that we have developed and we're now putting uh, the curriculum together based on these things. And the African American is autonomy resistance reform and radical and of course they have a timeline also in this 
and um in but theirs is no different from ours is it's more uh they're gonna start with historical perspective just like we are starting and moving forward to the present so the next step where are we heading with all this so June 5th, we finalized the draft of scope and sequence course outline. We met with CERC. Uh, and then by June 30th, we will identify a review panel uh, that we will be working with CERC to review this, this curriculum. June 30th, we will have a draft a professional learning plan. We'll be meeting soon on this because we want to make sure that the teachers are, in, are, are being provided uh, effective professional learning in, in, the, in these curriculums. Um, so, and I know some people had mentioned bringing in uh, outside uh, people to teach, like from the university level or from, and that would be good as speakers. But I would think that districts may have some problems with some with unions and, and negotiations if they bring someone to take over for a teacher when they have staff already in place. Uh, and that was discussed. I'm bringing everything to the table that we have talked about. On June 30, we will have a draft for the publication and dissemination, uh, and it will be in all types of format. And in July 8th, we will host an advisory group meeting with CERC. And then July 24th, the draft of the unit of studies of content development for both will be there. And August 21st, draft course integration and assessment will be, um, will be developed. Again, some of these dates may change a little, but we're trying to keep to them. Now, some concerns by the group uh again if you could consider teacher preparation programs could support this type of work having at the university level this type of course consider including in the work on the course workload in job descriptions for example if i'm gonna um, look for a new teacher maybe put something like this in the job description Comprehensive ongoing professional learning that was critical for us. We don't want a drive through type of one time professional development. We want this to be consistent, continuous, and we want to have teachers training other teachers. So we like to develop a trainer of trainers within this process. Consider policy changes, development that include pedagogy, that include all our children. In other words, um, and I did this in my high school where uh, someone may te be teaching something in another department, but it doesn't mean that uh, other teachers cannot do the same in other areas, in other um, departments. Um, so, can we go? Uh, another suggestion that group thought is like looking at Gateway, they have a peace study certification program. Uh, uh, a framework for undoing racism. They said, it. Uh, I have not seen it, but I heard that it was very uh, uh, good and, um, and it aligns much with what we're doing because a lot of these resources we could bring into the high school. Include search work regarding courageous conversation, again, bringing it into the high school, speakers, Consider pursuing a certification to teach this course, even intention for K-12 curriculum. So if we expand this to a K-12, uh, that I hope that we start looking into, that we should start looking into ha having someone with some uh, with a stronger background in this, a certification piece. That's Those are just comments. Those are things that they were considering. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lavas, for sharing the update. Uh, we can certainly ask, uh, answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, I, I have comments. If Eric, will you allow me to make my, my comments? And uh... you, you go before me. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Here's the, you know, here are my comments. This is being done at such a timely moment. 
that um, again, we, we had never anticipated last year when this was approved, how, how needed this would be. So um, there are two or three things that I want to sort of suggest. One is you don't have in there, you have an internal process for, um, which is you know very adequate and, and appropriate for the um, school setting. But I think you need to do more. I think you really need to think about a communication plan that includes um, parents, you know, uh, and includes also, I've heard comments from some teachers that do not see the need to this. They, when it was first approved, do not see the need to this. So um, why is this such a critical component? You know, and to parents also, why is this, it's so important and critical. And Malia is a parent, so she can probably suggest better things than I can because, I'm, you know, my 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 daughters are, are out of school. But I, I do think you need a communication approach to to this, to to you know, to educate people the significance of doing this. I think you also need to identify what you know we've been talking now in these very difficult times about allies. Who are your allies in terms of? ensuring that people there's buy-in in in the schools where 93 percent of the teachers are white and that doesn't mean that can mean multiple things but who are the allies in terms of buying it about the significance of this course that is not a tokenism that is a critical component of the education of all children so to me those are the two things that i i um, i want to bring to to your to the table because i think they're significant pieces to make ensure that this happens without opposition and that it happens uh, academically appropriate appropriately also thank you mm -hmm. can i can i add something please i, I wanted to follow estella's uh, uh footsteps if i may yes um i made some notes and i'll just i'll just give you some tidbits as to what i i like to suggest also um you named capital community college right and I and I can you elaborate on what that meant? What what kind of collaboration was going to happen with Capital no, Community that was College? Gateway, Chief, they mentioned Gateway, not Capital. Okay, okay, gateway. I'm sorry. Yes, Gateway. Yes, thank you, thank you for correcting me. Gateway. What can you tell me? What the what is the collaboration going to consist of with Gateway? Well, it, we're going to have collaboration with uh, every uh, higher ed components in the state of Connecticut. Okay. Um, uh, right now, under committees, we have someone from Central, we have someone from uh, Gateway, we have someone from UConn, we have someone from a different universe, Southern, we have different universities, because a lot of these universities have provided this, are providing some, these types of concepts in, in the curriculum. And yes. so, and, and how we want to uh, continue that communication is like, for example, if a high school needs to have a spokesperson, let's say they're doing a topic, and let's mm -hmm. say someone at Central, this person has that expertise, bring them in as a speaker. And that's what they were talking about in the committee, you know, to okay. have, a, have resources available to teachers in, in this curriculum. Yes, thank you. You may want to instead of identifying one community college, you may you may you may leave it broad where it talks about different higher education settings. Okay, I, I mean that's just a suggestion because I only saw gateway on there. the The other thing is is that I'd like to suggest is that in the in the higher education settings, we have Africana and and Puerto Rican Latino Caribbean centers that you may want to utilize for those uh, positive role models for both of these communities to come in and talk about the different perspectives from culture to language to you know whatever your curriculum is gonna be designed. Because we all know that we have a lot of young students at, and from high school to college that it could become kind of a, a, a cross-cultural, right? Where we, where we exchange ideas and we learn from each other, especially from, from both, both communities. So you may want to also keep that in mind. Um, and I and the, the other thing is 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 the most important thing is is that I like the fact that that um, I heard that this is the second year. Estella, is that what you said that this is the second year, or is this going to be the first time implementing it? And remember, I'm the new I'm the I'm the newbie, so I'm trying to get myself acclimated to. Yeah, I will. Uh, this was just approved 
last year by the legislature, so they're developing to implement it for the first time next year. That's why I said there has to be a communication plan to explain to parents why this is being done and to you know in, ensure that teachers also support it because when it was approved last year and this is among us it was sometimes it was somewhat controversial let me put it that way i think yeah. today in today's environment it's such a critical course and it's such a welcome um a, you know a mm -hmm. thing that it happened but you know it, you still need to be able to communicate it and to explain what it is and to to ensure that it is well received and that there are allies there that support it. Yes, and that we have also, uh, whoever's gonna teach this course has ha has the rigorous background of, of you know, um, of, of the, the different content areas, because not everybody can do the history of Puerto Rico versus South and Central America, right? Or, or, or Ghana versus African-American history. So therefore, I you know, we, we've got to really, uh, pay close attention and be meticulous about who are those folks that are gonna be teaching this curriculum so that the students could get the best out of this experience. And I, and Eric, thank you. Anyone, anyone else? Malia, Martha? I have a question. Can you, am I coming through okay? Let me just ask that. I can hear you. Okay. Um, it's a slow connection on my end. So um, a point of clarification. Um, so the intention is that this would be, uh, in terms of timeline of implementation, the intention is that it would be optional. Is that right in year 21-22 and mandatory in 22-23? Am I getting the academic years correct? Yeah, according to the timeline, it will it will be optional next year, 2021. Okay. So, yeah. so we... 2021 or 2122? Uh, in the PowerPoint, because I have to go back to it. Do you have I think it was 20, I think it was the second year, Malia, 20, I think it was 22, 23, where there was the word shall, which was the operative in, in that, correct? Thank you. Correct. Yes, thank you, yeah. thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Full academic years until it's mandatory. Right. Right. Okay. right. All right, thanks. And then um, in your in your PowerPoint, uh, Gladys, you had given some um, overviews of some additional themes for the uh, the Puerto Rican studies portion. I'm assuming, it, or, or were there similar sorts of themes that had come out for um, for the Black African American studies as well? I was just curious that it was a little lighter on that description well, than they the, had the, the, they, they had these themes and um they had it more in terms of chronological so with these themes and so right now our discussion is how are we gonna look at the curriculum through is it through chronological or through typically through these themes so we're still having that discussion now, but I believe that uh, the two groups agreed on the themes. That's that, and what you saw is what they have agreed to do. Now, the question right now, and we're having meetings as we, we're going to have another meeting tomorrow, is going to look at it from a chronological perspective, a historical, chronological, historical, or are we going to just take the themes? and just bring them in. And so that is one of the discussions we're having as, as, as a committee, both both groups together, we're having that. But no, they have more information. I just didn't have it with me to be able, this is what we presented to the whole group last time, uh, to another group that we're uh, presenting to at CERC. Great. But thank you. Okay, so my last, my last comment is just a comment, which is, I um, I am thrilled to see this, and um, it sounds like it's just one one course that is then uh, that a student can take either at any point during their high school career. Is that right? It's a one credit course, and one semester it will be uh, Black right. African Americans and then Latino Puerto Rican. And we wanted it to be at the junior year, 
for them to take it. And it's still, even though it must be offered, it's still an elective. Uh, so two years from now, it's still, well, well, basically it just requires that the school has it, but it's not required that a student takes it. Exactly. Right. It's, it's not a graduation easy. requirement at this time. Yeah, it is, but it, it'll be a full year course. And um, yes, the, the important thing is it'll be part of their program course of study guide offered to the students at the local level. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'll just reiterate, it makes me sad because I'd also like to find a time right in that we are that we're not just looking at just one course, but that we are talking about a more inclusive curriculum across the board that tells mm -hmm. the full and complete story of our American experience um rather than just just this one course that a student may or may not take at some point before they graduate so that's my two cents if if i may <coughs> I, I think the, strong the very strong curriculum that is being developed in this partnership is going to prove its weight once it gets into the hands of the teachers mm -hmm. and it, it's on the teachers and the district administrators to then bring it forward to their board of ed to say that this needs to be a graduation requirement so i think the the work that dr labas is doing and with the circ team the more that we can put in their hands and they start to realize the power of it and the students advocate for it the teachers are advocating um, we, and certainly we can push in that direction, but it would be for that Board of Education to then say this has to be a, a graduation requirement. Mm -hmm. For the oh, yeah, you process. You got it? I, I know you, so I know. I'll come back to you. All right. Martha, anything? Oh, uh, I'm actually really, uh, Irene just addressed a lot of the points I was uh, thinking uh, about asking is the more tactical boots on the ground how districts are going to uh, have to react to this it's a very timely moment and it's a huge moment so it's great it's how would you support people to take it and run with it in the best way possible to see its success um, but also like touching on the whole graduation requirements discussion how will students be able to fit it in to what they have to do if it is only an elective and how do you guys foresee that happening? Yeah, in terms of scheduling, and I did high school scheduling for 30 years, and this is where the training comes in. <laughs> um, and, and I've mentioned this at the committee, um, is that we need to really provide a strong professional development for leaders at school be and see the need of this being offered because as you well know i could take any course i don't care if it's elective or i i i could make a course disappear just the way i schedule it during the day um let's be you know and 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 we need to make sure that this course is not that it, it serves the diverse population in school that people that in other words that if students are taking a bilingual class during period five like the course and if they wanted to take this course and it's you know in its offering junior year let's not put it against a period five let's move it in a different period so more students will be able to take it you see i'm just giving you an example of, of just a, a small piece of the scheduling process but also the way we sell it at the school of, of building administrators as teachers um that's going to be a major component and i think maybe a will that you mentioned the teacher uh, you know the teacher especially in the elective if the kids know that this teacher is going to bring them forward that this is important to this, this teacher and that this is going to be um uh providing them more background um in 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 the culture many of them will take it and because they know the teacher they know the teacher will do this uh, so there's the training again professional development comes in to play major and and i do think with the way the graduation requirements are now written this course could actually be taken under a number of elective areas so it can be in the within the humanities it's allowable probably not so much as a language, it can't replace that, but it would be in the, no. the social studies. So I think 
Um, yeah. Even though it sounds like a standalone course, I think there are some flexibilities within the graduation requirements and how they're written to give students more options to access the course for sure. Yeah. And we talked about that and that's it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Gladys, uh, at the board level, we're not supposed to do the curriculum. So this is what I'm going to say to you is just an observation, okay? I have taught courses in Puerto Rico, both chronologically and, uh, and then thematic. The thematic courses work better. That's all my. That's all I'm going to say. It was because you could engage it from the beginning of what is present and don't take them along the historical component. So, from my wow. perspective, that type of approach worked better. So, I'm I'm just leaving it like that, and I will. I'm with will, you. <laughs> and I know this is being recorded. <laughs> right. Exactly. So it's an observation. <laughs> Thanks, Estella. <laughs> Anything else um, from anyone? So I, I will say, um, Eric, Eric, may I, may I, yes, Eric, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be sure. Please. I promise you. Um, <laughs> I really think um, I just, I just want to uh, thank Irene and Gladys because I really think that this is very important for this generation of uh, Generation Z to understand the importance of the their history, their identity. Okay. Um, because as we all know, they're having challenges with who am I, you know, am I, am I this, am I that? And, um, you know, in growing up in two cultures, this was the best thing that happened to me. We were able to speak the language, carry our culture, pass it on to our children with pride. Um, so therefore I really commend you because it, it, it was needed. It was needed a long time ago. And, um, and I, and I look forward, um, that the institutions will support you, the higher education institutions. So count, please count on them. Okay. I will. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you for that. It, certainly the work, there's a lot of work that has been done that predates both of us. And I can tell you from being yes. at the district level when the statute came through, we were so grateful for this because this is this was what we needed at the local level. And um it replaces a lot of narrow-minded ways of creating courses of just about social justice. This statute really opened it up in such a great way for districts to really think differently. So, and I, I think the important thing is behind the legislature is the curriculum. That's the big piece. So the work that Gladys is doing, Dr. Labas is doing with the team and CERT is so critical to move this at the local level. So. I appreciate what you're saying, but I really can't take any credit for it. But we're we're on the team now to to continue moving it forward. So thank and you. And I just want to lastly say that I understand what Malia is saying about it's not required. Well, and I know we could have pushed to make the legislation uh, had to negotiate a little to get this through. And uh, it's like when we wrote the bilingual law back in 1977, we wanted to have it look differently. But guess what? If we wanted to get it passed, we had to do certain negotiate. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. And um, so, yeah. And eventually, we're going to keep pushing, uh, see if we could get this as a requirement. And it may, you know, it may be happening sooner than later. <laughs> Thank you. Um Dr. Lattis, well, I, I wanted to say really quickly, I, I think one, very much what Acela was saying, that this is an extraordinary time. And to be central to this conversation and having the responsibilities as a board member, given what is going on, especially this conversation, to me is, is quite an honor and, and um, a huge responsibility as well. Um, secondly, I think what I didn't see in there that I would love to see explicitly was the idea of beauty and dignity. Um, a lot of what was delivered or going to be delivered to the young people um, as it relates to um, Puerto Rican history and, and African-American history, it sounds really about uh, defiance and, and, and discourse to me. Um, but there are times of peace, right? And, and, and there are there is beauty in all of these things. There is dignity in all of these things that was not, I did not learn that about my my people while in school, right? Beauty was defined very differently to me, right? And was, was, was delivered very differently. And I think if we can think about that um, 
and think about it explicitly, uh, I think that I would be happy with that. And also I fall on the side of Malia, but I don't want to belabor this. I, I think revolutionary ideas as this has been touted are only revolutionary when there's revolutionary action behind the idea. And I, I feel like, I think it being an elective and kind of optional is, is a little problematic for me, right? Given the saturation of, of um, European thinking that, that, that countless kids have gotten, myself included, and a lot before me. And so the, the fact that we're bringing this onto the stage as an option um, is a little bit problematic for me, but I know the way it's presented and the times we are in that I think kids and teachers and community will get behind it. And, and, and um, although it will be an option, it won't feel like one, I'm sure. But I, I'm just very grateful to be within this conversation um, as this goes forward. So thank you. Thank you all. We can move on. Is that <laughs> please, Irene? I was just saying thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I are we ready to move to the next item? Uh, we are. Jared? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. So let me uh, pull up that PowerPoint. the The next item, and uh, maybe I'll say a couple of words uh, to just preface this. The next item has to do with school and district accountability. A complete kind of mind shift here. Um, so. <laughs> What we're bringing to you is, is not a solution as much as just an update on where things stand as it pertains to accountability and an assessment in light of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the impact that it is having for the year that we're just wrapping up, the school year we're wrapping up, which is 1920, but also impact for uh, school year 2021. So and maybe even a, a little bit beyond, because when you when you take away the assessment for one year, there are downstream impacts as a result of it. So uh, let me let me bring up the PowerPoint. And because there are some newer board members, I'm just going to take a few minutes to just refresh what our school and district accountability model actually does uh, at a very high level. I mean, there is so much detail in here uh, that. Uh, frankly, uh, when Rene uh, Savoy, who's on this call, Danielle Bousquet, who's on this call, and, and myself, when we come back to these topics, we have to take 15 minutes just grounding ourselves because there's just a lot of detail. So I am not going to get you down to that level at all, but but just give you a high level just so that we have a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, so give me a moment while I share my screen. I sent you this uh, PowerPoint um, in a PDF format, and in here is a link to a YouTube video as well. So if you just want to watch a two-minute video, if you are if you aren't sick of my voice after this thing and you still want to hear some more, you can get that quick overview. Um, I'm briefly going to review the indicators in the system, uh, some of the system features and the resources we provide, and also some lessons we already have learned in terms of promising practices and the types of transformations this accountability system is uh, fostering. And then I'll end with a few slides on the COVID-19 implications. The system is a multiple measures system, uh, somewhat like a balanced scorecard, if you're familiar with that terminology, where it's looking at multiple indicators of uh, student participation and student success. So it looks at academic achievement, uh, which is really just how did kids do in a year. It looks at academic growth, which is the change of students, the same student from one year to the next, where we're not just looking at which kids you have, but really how have you grown the kids that you have. And that element, academic growth, is a huge part of our accountability system and actually garners the greatest number of points in the system. Um, we look at participation rate because we want to make sure kids are being tested. There are no points for it, but there are some um, decision rules that are applied. We look at chronic absenteeism 
which is the students who are missing uh, at least 10% of their academic days, uh, of their school days uh, in a given year. We look at college and career readiness in a couple of ways. We look at our students taking rigorous courses, which is indicator five. And then we look to see our students meeting benchmark on exams, that's indicator six. We have three ways of looking at graduation. We look at whether students are on track in ninth grade, whether they're graduating on time, which is indicator eight, the four-year graduation rate. And then uh, we also look at a six-year graduation rate, which is for students who we call our high needs, which are really students uh, from low-income families, English learners, or students with disabilities. We, we put them in a group that we call high needs uh, so that we have enough end sizes when we look at uh, down to the school level and even to the grade level when we do reporting of these data. We look at whether students are entering post-secondary after they graduate from high school. Um, and then we also look to see whether uh, how students are doing on our physical fitness assessment and whether they're participating in arts courses. So it really tries to take a holistic view of school and district performance. You'll notice that some of these indicators have an H next to them, which basically uh, reflects the fact that uh, those schools are actually receiving additional points in the system, uh, separate points for students uh, who are identified as high needs. Um, and that's actually a huge component of our system. This chart really just visually illustrates that the red part, which is the, uh, uh, the academic growth for elementary and middle schools, that's actually the biggest component of their uh, scorecard. We don't have growth for high schools because we don't administer academic assessments in the early, in the uh, annually in those grades. Uh, and, so, and we could also argue that once we get to high school, we really, the, the, the focus of education broadens and we actually, many of our indicators do focus on, on high school. Uh, some of the features of the system, and I'm going to go through this quickly just in the interest of time and really more to open up for your questions and discussion. Um, we have ultimate targets for every indicator. So in this case, it's academic achievement and points are earned on a sliding scale. So in, in vast majority of the cases, you know, they're not all or nothing in terms of how a district earns points. They're actually earned on a sliding scale. So the closer they are to their ultimate target on a particular indicator, the more points they get. And we roll up actually, and this is an example of a particular district's scorecard. So you'll see that there's all these different indicators that are broken out uh, into all students, high needs, et cetera. And, and every one of them earns points for the school or district. And then there is ultimately an overall score that's generated that's called the accountability index. And uh, you can think of it like a GPA. And if you go to EdSight, our data portal, and look in the report cards, you'll see a dial that looks like this that basically tells you how the um, how the school or district is doing on that overall measure. Now, again, it's the overall measure because it's like a GPA, it's really made up of all the ingredients that go into it. So the overall number is only useful as a starting point. You really need to get into the individual indicators to see strengths and challenges. And the overall um, uh, accountability index is like a zero to 100 scale. Um, and uh, about 13% of our schools last year had an accountability index that was 85 or greater, that's kind of our benchmark for what we expect, where we expect schools to be. So we still have a long way to go in terms of uh, getting all our schools to, to high levels of performance, overall performance. And just so you know that this accountability index is used uh, for, for some uh, important things. We use it to break schools into categories. We use it to identify alliance districts. We use it to identify some of our high support schools, but we also use it to identify schools of distinction, which are schools we recognize. Um, so what are some other features of the system? It has uh, a way it categorizes schools into one through five. Categories four and five are the schools that need support from the state. Uh, uh, one subset of those schools is called turnaround schools or comprehensive support schools. And we have 35 of those schools currently receiving state support. And then there are focus schools. Uh, which uh, typically have consistent low growth. That academic growth measure that I spoke about, focus schools have consistently among the lowest growth for their high need students in a particular subject, ELA, uh, English language arts or mathematics. So if a school three years in a row is showing among the lowest 
uh, growth in the state, then those schools get identified as focus schools, and uh, we currently have about 30 schools that we're working with. Um, we, I mentioned participation rate. Um, there are, we also look at achievement gap and gap in graduation rate. If any of those uh, factors are present in a school that otherwise would have been categorized as one or two, that school actually gets dropped a category. They might grow from one to two or two to three. And I also mentioned schools of distinction. I think the point I'll make here is that we have lots of schools in, in alliance districts who we recognize every year as uh, uh, some of them are high performance, but many of them are high growth schools. So they might not have some of the highest achieving students, but they are able to grow whoever they get every year, and they're among the highest growers in the state. So. That's been telling for us. We've used that information not only to recognize those schools through our accountability model, but also identify several of those schools for blue ribbon distinction over the years. We have a ton of resources. I'm not gonna go into each of these. We have uh, uh, student level data that we provide through EdSite Secure, which is an analytics tool that's available to secure users in districts. We also have a comprehensive guide that's referenced here which goes indicator by indicator and provides a whole wealth of resources for districts on how to improve their current, um, um, current status on any particular measure. So if they wanna improve academic achievement or chronic absence or college and career readiness or on track to high school graduation or post-secondary entrance, there's, a, there's explanations about how those indicators are calculated, but then there's a ton of resources available to them. Uh, we've recently focused on FAFSA completion as well, and student level information is going down to the school level on FAFSA completion. Um, and we also provide interim assessments to, to, to districts at no cost. These are aligned, high quality interim assessments uh, that are available to districts as well. So what have we learned? We've learned a lot of things and showcased several of those lessons learned in, in uh, uh, publications that we've put out. Uh, we have uh, done newsletters, we have held forums where we have had uh, schools and districts come and talk about what they're doing. Uh, and of course, we have the Learn Together, Grow Together uh, system as well. And in a nutshell, some of the things uh, we have learned are you know, implement standards with fidelity. It's key. You can't cheat on the standards. Um, and you know, sometimes these benchmark assessments, these commercial assessments, may actually muddle the picture. And we provided our robust block assessments really to provide more actionable information for teachers. When assessment is close to curriculum and to the teaching, the information is actionable for teachers. Um, we have uh, learned that interventionists in many of these school districts have interventionists and support personnel. Uh, it's important to keep those individuals in the professional learning mix. Uh, sometimes it's the professional learning is focused for the teachers and the interventionists are forgotten. We've learned that districts, uh, some of our high growth districts tend to focus on interventionists. Uh, protecting that professional learning time is huge. Um, and coaches, there are several examples where we've uh, seen the effective use of coaches to support the improvement of classroom instruction. Uh, teaching is a, is, a, is a craft, it's an art. Uh, there is a science to it, but there's also an art aspect to it. And, and when coaches are used strategically, the, the teachers really can reflect on their own practice and improve. Uh, we've also learned that it's important to focus on the little data. It's not just about big data, big survey assessments, state assessments, and standardized assessments. It's really about the day-to-day -day stuff that students do and that interaction between students and teachers. We've learned that that actually has the power to turn this around. Uh, we are seeing a lot of examples, especially in middle school, of student ownership not just of the learning, but also of the assessment itself. We've, we've heard examples of how uh, students actually said, you know what, when we're taking the Smarter Balanced Assessment, why couldn't we be in uh, a different room than where we're going to? We'd feel a lot more comfortable in, uh, if we were doing it in a, in, a, in a different space or at a different time. Or, you know, it, it, and, and students have pointed out, and teachers actually have pointed out how some of those benchmark assessments that they use, those assessments actually are structured and administered in very different ways from some of our state assessments. And they actually send the wrong message. One simple example is being timed. Our state assessment is not timed. It's an untimed assessment that really, except for the SAT at the high school level, the Smarter Balanced Assessments and our science assessments are not timed. They're really not designed to put that kind of time pressure on kids, allow them to sort of demonstrate their uh, 
uh, knowledge and assess and achievement uh, in a in a less stressful environment. They can pause the test, come back another day, and pick up where they left off. Lots of flexibilities that some of the other commercial assessments don't provide. So it's important to sort of so teachers have kind of figured those types of things out and how they might be sending mixed messages. Um, and again, the, the the fact that you know leaders, the role of leaders, and and them instilling the belief in our teachers and our students that everybody can succeed at challenging work, and of course we the the, the positive climate and the trust. Uh, it, it's not just between teachers and students, but also among them uh, as being key. All right. So so what are some of the implications of uh, what happened in in COVID um, nineteen pandemic? So the first thing that happened was uh, when COVID happened in mid-March, um, as one after another, the state started realizing that schools were going to be canceling in-person classes and going to remote learning. It became clear that it would really not be a fair assessment, or there really wasn't even a way to administer this assessment if kids weren't in school, uh, or that it would even be a fair measure. So. Uh, the US Department of Ed basically allowed a way for all states to seek a waiver, and it was really a checklist waiver, um, which made it super streamlined so that we did not have to administer any state academic assessments. And consequently, uh, we would not be administering uh, or, or delivering any accountability system. So all the accountability system that I talked about just now, there will be no assessment and no reporting on uh, as a whole on the accountability system for 1920. We might report on some indicators, but the system as a whole, we're not going to be able to do a report for based on the 2019-20 data. So it's like a big, huge gap year for us. Um, so what happens in 2021, right? So so that so 2020 is uh, uh, 1920 is done. We're we're moving into the school year 2021. But it's not coming back to, um, uh, we're not just gonna come right back to everything the way things were and everything is gonna be uh, just as it was prior to COVID. There are still, there's a lot of talk of blended learning and some challenges are gonna, uh, you know, we, we're still trying to deal with device access issues, connectivity issues. We know that some of those things uh, are disproportionately prevalent in some of our Alliance districts, especially our opportunity districts. Uh, which are our 10 lowest performing districts. So there are clearly challenges that we're still working on. So even learning in 2021 is, is, uh, is potentially gonna be impacted as well. So academic achievement is, uh, is obviously at the end of 21, uh, it, it has, has some questions. Now academic growth, which is indicator two, it is really not possible in a formal way because we don't have a, a baseline measure in 1920. So not only do we have no growth in 1920, we don't have growth even in 2021 because there's not a way to do uh, uh, 20 to 21 growth. Uh, the EL assessment for English learners was administered uh, just before COVID ended in uh, 1920. And their next assessment is scheduled to be assessed, uh, administered in winter of 21. But their learning has been impacted because of COVID. So that's something uh, where 2021 is impacted. Chronic absenteeism, where, you know, for 1920, we, we are basically collecting attendance information as of when, as of mid-March, really, only for those in-person days. But we're not sure what 21 is going to bring, 2021. So we've got to figure out what does it mean to be in attendance? Uh, what if a parent wants to uh, keep their child home uh, because of some health situation, even if vast majority of students are in person and the school is providing a distance learning option for that child, for that student. How do we deal with the definition of attendance for chronic absence? So there's stuff to be worked out there. Um, one of our indicators on benchmark attainment, number six, uh, we canceled the SAT this year. That's a big part of that uh, indicator. It includes other indicators as well, other assessments as well, like ACT. I know the AP was administered, but it was administered remotely. Um, access issues might play a part there. IB, which is also part of that indicator, canceled their exams. So, and, and we're trying to make up for that, but that indicator is impacted for 2021. Uh, and then you have indicator 10, which is in this economic climate, generally, you know, you tend to see um, less, historically, you tend to see less participation in post-secondary. So that becomes a, a, an issue to, to, to consider for 2021. 
So when we think of our overall accountability index, which is our summative sort of rating, our GPA type score, you know, uh, we won't have growth indicator 2A through 2D, which is a big part of uh, that uh, index. So that is impacting that overall score. Plus the other indicators are impacted by some of these factors. So lots, a lot of moving parts in here uh, when it comes to 2021, and we feel like that's impacted as well. So we think that this will have implications for us for identifying the next round of schools for comprehensive support or turnaround, that we'll have to push that back at least a year. Uh, it was originally scheduled to be fall of 21, but now we might have to push it back to fall of 22 for the new round of schools. It also has implications for our focus schools because we're gonna miss two years of growth, that gets pushed back to fall of 23. So a lot of moving uh, uh, parts with this stuff, which uh, the states are still in conversations with the US Department of Ed about how to manage accountability um, for 2021 and how do all these pieces play in. Um, we're doing some creative thinking here. So we are actually using some statistical models to try to predict what students would have scored on their Smarter Balanced uh, assessment. This would not be for a formal accountability purpose um, because predictions always have some level of uh, error. We can do a good job with it and use it for informational purposes, but it really isn't um, built to support very high stakes decision making like school and district accountability. So, but we're trying to do that so that maybe gives some informational value to, to districts. Uh, we're trying to provide the SAT uh, for students who missed it, this the, the juniors who missed it this past uh, March, we're hoping to provide it to them. We're actually working to provide it for them uh, in the fall. We have a whole uh, system worked out for that, um, trying to trying to give them that option. Of course, some schools have gone optional, test optional in that time frame. Um, and then lastly, we're also trying to promote sensible assessment practices. You know that that really focus on that small grain classroom-based assessment that's aligned to the standards and that can actually help teachers. So, um, we're, we're and we're continuing to think, but I just wanted to uh, think creatively, but I just wanted to at least lay out kind of where our thinking is at this point, because not doing a test in one year uh, really has a um, lot of downstream implications for, for longitudinal systems. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and, and, uh, and pause to, to take uh, take questions and engage in a discussion. Thanks, Ajit. Any questions? I don't know that I have a question. You know how I work, Eric. Sometimes I just start talking and a question comes out. And maybe that's um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I did want to I did want to thank you, Ajit, for for going through and regrounding um, all of us too in the accountability um, system and and it, it is really it it's disheartening right we all want to have answers about what we're going to walk into in the fall and the reality is that we just don't right and and i think the last point that you left off with is is i don't know maybe maybe that'll be the the thing that we're all just going to have to have to be comfortable with in terms of what teachers find with those students when when they walk back in when they show up on a zoom you know, assessment or conversation in the fall. Um, you know, that's my biggest concern is just how do we get a good handle? And, and teachers, I would think, are going to be, they're of course going to be on that front line of, of figuring out, right? How either how much was lost or where do they need to pick up from in order to be able to be successful with students? Um, you know, you know, my love of data and Estella shares it, I know. So having a gap is painful. Um, <laughs> but it is what it is and we'll figure it out and um, so no question just appreciation for um for the complexities that we're all going through and and just the willingness to struggle through it with you um i i, I did again i do like want to respond to one point okay please if, if if i might just uh just even though you didn't ask a question i do want to volunteer some information if you will <laughs> uh, which is that you know in addition to sort of focusing on assessment that's close to the classroom that's actually helpful for the teacher to do something with the students who they have uh, we're also making the the point that 
for students who are returning to Connecticut public school, we actually know a lot about them. Even though we don't have one year of testing uh, for a fourth grader or fifth grader, for example, we have four years, if they've been in Connecticut public schools, we know we have four or five years of attendance data. We have we know which schools uh, they have moved through. We have mobility information. Uh, if they have taken a smarter balance in prior years, we have that information. Uh, if they took the kindergarten inventory, if it's a younger student and was administered that kindergarten entrance rating, we have some of that information. Uh, we also have, um, uh, and districts have a lot of other assessment information that they might have administered in the early reading uh, assessments in the early grades. Uh, so the, what, the point we're trying to make is that we're not, for students who are brand new to Connecticut, of course, we may need to have some kind of screening, some kind of tool, but for students who are returning, we actually have a lot. And we're trying to remind our folks that, you know, we don't need to administer large scale assessments because those can only tell you so much. What is needed is really actionable information for classroom teachers. Ajit, again, thank you. and. Um, I, I also have a comment. My, my comment has to do with if there are proxies that you can use to sort of not necessarily do the formal um, accountability, but sort of give us a sense of where things are. And one of the, the questions is we've heard that there are many students or some students that disappear, that never took online. Do you have that information, for example? Um, would that be something that you'll be sharing with us? Because to me, that's a very critical indicator or proxy or whatever you want to call it in looking at the landscape and what, which districts had more students disappearing. Um, I know suspensions this year will not happen because, you know, nobody was suspended, thank God, you know. But um, also in terms of completing where finals given, you know, in, in classes, what, what sort of assignments in the um, in the level of uh, death and all that were the assignments higher level, uh, you know, demand that required whatever. Again, I'm, I'm looking at, I wanna know what sort of learning took place and how many students participating in the learning. Uh, although, like you said, that's not the type of accountability we usually use, but I still, it gives me comfort to understand that. I, if it's available. Thank you. Uh, I think that makes perfect sense, Estella. I think um, uh, accountability in this time frame is not about testing and academic accountability. It's about provision of equitable opportunities for all students accountability. Um, so yes, we did do a survey uh, which asked for the extent of student participation in distance learning during this time uh, as well as uh, barriers that students may have faced um, relative to uh, not having a device, meaning that they had to share a device with someone in the house. Maybe there were two other kids in school and they had to take turns, like when they sat at the computer or shared a device, uh, and also the connectivity, like did you have broadband, what was the barrier? So we have those data and we're sort of finishing up a report. And uh, I'll just give you the high, the high level was that about 74% of our students, districts reported, this is an estimate, uh, districts reported that 74% of our students actually participated fully in distance learning. Um, but the flip of it is the uh, among the opportunity districts, those 10 districts, and, and really even among our four largest cities, that was not necessarily the case. So those types of data, uh, are being finalized and, and uh, we have shared those data with the governor's office as well because they are coordinating that rapid connectivity deployment group which is looking to solve those connectivity issues before we come back in the fall. You know the 60,000 laptops that uh, uh, are being distributed to uh, Alliance districts and beyond but I know that uh, SDE along with the governor's office is advocating and, and uh, reaching out to for more support, for more devices, not necessarily to get every the state one-to-one, -one, because one-to-one -one means that it's a school-issued device. Many kids don't need a device from the school. They have a device or their family has been able to procure a device. But for those for whom it's a barrier, the school should be able to provide one. So that's the gap that we're trying to fill. And uh, 
we are working very actively towards that. And so that data are being finalized, Estella, and will be released. And I agree with mm -hmm. you. I think that is what accountability should be about, like right now, and and really in the early fall. Yeah, and 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 I you mentioned if accountability means um, means access. So you said seventy four percent. So there's twenty six percent remaining. So we want a hundred percent accessibility for technology, right? Now the other concern that I have, and I want I want just food for thought, is the following. Okay, so now they were not tested. Students were not tested this year, right? And next year, this is going to be an option. Okay, uh, and I'm looking at this. At, you know, I tend to I tend to be a visionary. I look long term. Um, does that mean? Um, and you know, I don't have the answers that we're setting up more kids for failure because if if testing is another option, they may not choose to test again, especially for the SATs in prep for college. So well, I mean, yes. The, please tell um, me more about that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just to clarify, uh, mm -hmm. the state assessment is not an option. It's a required assessment for all students in grades three through eight and eleven. The mm -hmm. fall SAT that we're doing uh, mm -hmm. is an option in the sense that the student didn't ha didn't take it in in um, uh, in the spring, and when we mm -hmm. come in the in the fall. We're not, we're not forcing students to take the SAT. We're gonna okay. make it available to them. And we do, because it is a state provided uh, no cost assessment to them and mm -hmm. districts will provide it either in during the school day or in the, or in the weekend. Uh, but this mm -hmm. won't be an accountability assessment, meaning like we won't actually hold schools okay. accountable for how students do on this, on this test. Come next spring 21, we're mm -hmm. again keeping fingers uh, crossed. Mm -hmm. Come next mm -hmm. spring, hopefully we're back. Uh, there's some semblance of normalcy, and that we are able to really uh, go back to administering our state assessments. So it, it's not optional at that point. It's just that this fall administration for last year's juniors is uh, we're we're saying that it's not an accountability assessment. It's available gotcha. to them at no cost. Uh, but we okay. won't like make a report card out of it and hold schools okay. accountable. Thank you, us. thank you for the clarity. Because sure. I don't want to set the kids up for failure. You know, it's a disservice when they. Um, and then the other thing is, um, is are you is there accountability when they enter post secondary higher education? That in terms of, um, I know now you know you can't go into social security, but students have IDs now. You know, so are are, are you keeping track of um, of students that graduate from? from community colleges or four-year institutions? Uh, yes, we do. Um, we know for what I showed you was the formal school accountability that we're implementing. Yes. So we're holding our K-12 schools and districts accountable for entrance to post-secondary. But in terms of knowing what happens to those students, absolutely. We know how many of them go on and graduate from college uh, six years Beautiful. out. We have those data that we have actually shared back with the school districts as well. And those reports okay. are available publicly as well. And as I think a few months back, we came to when the board was meeting personally, we came to the board and talked about remediation rates as well in uh, in our state uh, universities and community college system. Uh, that's happened. That's another way that we're keeping track of what's happening to our students after they leave us. OK, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Wilda. Uh, Martha, you have anything, Malia? <laughs> Malia? I'll let Martha if you do. Oh, um, I appreciate the update. I think you know, we're, all, we're all for wishful thinking, but for me, my biggest worry is what long distance, long-term distance learning is going to do. And at one point, I give the, the Department of Education so much credit for the hard work you've been doing, so I know you guys are gonna be on top of it. At some point, you may, if you're gonna have to cut over and start examining what you're doing to further calibrate how students are doing with distance learning to further calibrate the efforts if this is going to go on for a whole school year or two years or who knows what we're in for so i hope i'm wrong but that's that's my comment <laughs> thanks yeah, martha i mean I, I i yeah boy i i don't know how to how to respond to that i hope that is not the case i have two uh high school freshmen at home and 
Wow. Uh, I can tell you being uh, full-time distance learning is not ideal. Sorry. Uh, on a whole array of fronts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to, uh, I just wanted to actually build on um, on something that Awilda was asking about in terms of accountability, you know, more than just um, post-secondary entry, but then success through post-secondary. So I just would put a plug in that if there's an evolution to our accountability system, if there are um, opportunities to, to add in indicators uh, that, that help us to monitor progress through throughout um, put a little bit more on the on the hook for our high schools thanks Malia um, any other questions thoughts com comments it is 352 I know we had slotted uh, 230 to four o'clock and I, I want to be um, disciplined and compliant to that <laughs> anything else? I, I will just say, Eric, if that's okay. Um, sure. I, I'm looking forward, uh, Ajit, to the report that you were talking about in terms of what your what you do have data for um, in terms of the percentage of students that actually engaged with the online learning, what that looks like across um, you know populations, whether it's high needs populations across race ethnicity. Um, you know, name all the different disaggregations. I'd really like to to see all of that. I saw your your face change a little bit when I said yeah, the different. it's just that it's not a it's not a student level collection. What we we didn't do a student level collection because that's just that's just a huge undertaking. We may have to go down that path in the fall, uh, but what we collected now was district level sort of high level estimates. So we have data by district. But we don't have like student level data to be able to break out race and ethnicity and so on. So or other subgroups. But we do know uh, we do know uh, at a district level what the what the uh, what the issues are. And uh, if you look at some of the uh, summaries of comments that we did, because we got a ton of comments from districts, uh, it, it shouldn't surprise us in terms of where the areas of of uh, challenge are. Uh, administering uh, speech, uh, speech therapy in a virtual setting, you know, things like that, it's just not ideal. So I think you see the areas that are uh, challenging, even though we don't have sort of data to break it out into groups and, and, and quantitative data, we have qualitative data that speaks to where our challenges are within, uh, within districts that may be experiencing difficulties. Hence my expression. <laughs> <laughs> I'm debating beating the same drum or just letting it be. I think I'll let it be for the moment. <laughs> um, you know, my, my thing is, you know, when I saw a turnaround, the turnaround efforts were going to be backed up to 2022, I believe you said. That's why I said, man, that, you know, although in my mind I was thinking, you know, what would, what would be going on um, in terms of compliance to the accountability index, but to, to see that, um, you know, those schools that really need the most help and, and those resources, I mean, that that's tough, but, you know, as long as we're doing the best we can by, by the kids, uh, you know, which I know we are, uh, you know, that gives me solace. We still, just to clarify, we still have existing schools who are identified mm -hmm. as turnaround schools. They yeah. will continue to receive uh, the support. It's just that we won't have a fresh new yeah. identification um to uh, to do that that's what gets shifted back it would have happened in fall of 21 it gets shifted back to fall of 20. 22. Uh, Understood. Yeah, in, a year, in, a, in, a, in a year from now and it i'm sorry g in a year from now um we're able to see back to what malia saying how has all this impacted especially the high needy populations yeah. the pockets of, of folks who did not have access to technology, who are who are sharing rooms, who are sharing laptops, you know, who their Wi-Fi goes down. Um, it's because I deal with this every day, you know, with with my first generation low income population, especially with those H's, the ones who you identify as at this age. So, but uh, Ajit, thank you because I'm happy that I'm in this committee. I really appreciate it. Your your presentation was awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
It was great. Najeet, Irene, Dr. Lavis, and, and team, thank you so much. Uh, we are at our time. I know our next meeting is what, in September, correct? Yes, uh, that's what I wanted to just check in. It's it's okay. uh, we usually met in the mornings. Uh, yeah, I don't know if what what's preferred time and who knows what September where we'll be in September. Yeah, uh, but September it's September fourteenth. It's Monday, yeah. September fourteenth, nine thirty to eleven in the morning is what we have. Well, I, I like that better than two thirty in the afternoon. Uh, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, nine thirty is good for me, but I I will defer to to my colleagues, of course. That means Estella. <laughs> <laughs> you are mute. <laughs> yeah, I know. One of the prerogatives of the chair of the committee is you pick the date and the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> so, you. so yeah, let's let's go with that and um, unless there's a conflict that then we have to switch. So look for a meeting invite after this one to hold that date. Fantastic. Thank you all for your time. Um, it's Monday. Have a powerful week, you guys. All right. All right. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Bye. See you guys later.